Uh, welcome everyone to the second you know, our series of three. I wanna thank Sierra Circuits for putting this all together. Um, you know, I don't normally uh, do uh, this kind of um, training and instructions, but with the Sierra Circuits invitation, uh, uh, I sent them a list of training programs I've done in the past, and they picked out a, a few that they feel their customers and all of you are interested in. Um, so uh, this will be interesting because this is uh, uh, what I'll introduce to you are, are new ideas uh, focusing on HDI and ultra HDI for high density packaging and interposers. Um, so that may be new to you, uh, a lot of these ideas um, I've used at Hewlett Packard for 15, 18 years. So they're not necessarily new to us, uh, but with that, we'll, uh, we'll get started. Uh, the, a little about ultra HDI um, and then uh, back to um, conventional HDI where we're talking about 25 micron and 50 micron traces and spaces. The ultra HDI, the roadmap focuses down to five micron uh, traces and spaces. And then um, four novel um, HDI structures uh, that we have used at Cuba Packard or even invented, uh, but you may not be familiar with them. They're used in some of advanced European and Asian constructions, and then uh, our, our appendix. Uh, so ultra HDI is is the big advanced uh, techniques, and you can see there that the ultra HDI is really focused at the 25, 25 micron down to five and five for IC substrates and interposers, um, whereas print circuit boards uh, typically, the subtractive, you know, uh, goes down to about 75 micron lines and spaces or three mil lines and spaces, down to, you know, just above two mil lines and spaces at 30. 30. Um, and, and, you know, that involves HDI. And then there's kind of this uh, um, middle area uh, where we're moving from HDI to ultra HDI. Uh, with some of the uh, the PC boards illustrated there at the bottom, uh, where we've got multiple chips um, and or indoor chiplets now coming into it, uh, it the substrate is um, is larger than just a single chip package, uh, and so these circuit density improvements that there are a number of uh, conferences scheduled this year uh, focusing on. Uh, uh, moving below 25 and 20 micron lines and spaces uh, for fighter pitch parts. Uh, and you can see there on the right-hand side, um, that fine line routing out all of the pads. But today I'm gonna talk about more than just finer traces and spaces. Um, for those of you in the telecom thing, um, because of dielectric and copper losses, you can't always use the extremely fine traces and spaces um, because of the size of your boards and everything. But we're gonna talk about architectures and um, more than just traces and spaces um, in terms of utilizing ultra HDI and HDI technologies. Um, as an example, um, this is just my watching what Apple has been doing since from 2011 to, um, into the late 2020s with their iPhone. And you can see the, uh, you know, the technology started out as subtractive and then into MSAP. And the latest generation is the AM SAP, where we're dealing with, uh, with uh, 20 micron traces and 20 micron spaces. Um, three tracks there be between the 0.25 millimeter pitch BGA with 110 micron pad. Now this is gonna 
continue the technology. And in fact, uh, if I were to, uh, to have a roadmap like this of Qualcomm or NVIDIA, uh, they would be moving in under 20 microns into the 10 microns and sometimes the five micron. Um, so you know, this, the whole point of the CHIPS Act and what we're all been concerned about. And in fact, this is, uh, you know, plated copper traces at five micron lines and spaces um, techniques uh, in terms of the redistribution layer, RDL formulation, which is a semi-additive process um, because we're dealing with uh, um, not with foil or laminates, but with uh, uh, um, high performance films that are vacuum laminated. And then like this one uses a sputtered titanium barrier and a sputtered seed copper. Um, I worked with this uh, in 2006. So uh, um, 18 years ago, we were doing uh, uh, a couple of micron lines and spaces using sputtering. Uh, there are now techniques that can use uh, potentially additive electroless copper. Um, but uh, uh, what you see there is uh, the process that we used in 2006, 18 years ago, uh, in order to produce five micron lines and spaces at Hewlett Packard for IC packaging. And, and that's because our semiconductors were years and years ahead of everybody else, including Intel and TSMC. Um, and unfortunately, our silicon was 27 millimeters on a side and it had over 3,000 uh, pins, 3,000 IOs that we had to connect to. So uh, um, um, HP Laboratories uh, um, provided us with it really advanced technologies that I'm relating back here today. But we're today talking about BGA breakouts uh, and especially moving away from the classical north, south, east, west dog bone to a thing called swing vias. Uh, in other words, to move the breakouts to open up more routing channels uh, on the, the circuit board that makes it then easier. Uh, and we're focusing, see on the lower left-hand side, eliminating the large through-hole vias by going to HDI and then also uh, ultra HDI um, and then a stack ups that allow us to um, put together uh, horizontal and vertical routing pairs with these blind vias. So the combination of fan out and escape traces you know, have the purposes of routing out larger BGAs and pin arrays. Uh, and you can see the definition here of the, the ball pad, you know, the fan out vias and the escape traces uh, from, the, from a, a BGA. Uh, so moving away from this north, south, east, west dog bones, once you have a blind via, uh, that only drops down one or two layers. Um, you can now um, immerse those vias actually into the, the pad. So it could be an inset near via and pad next to the pad, can be a partially via pad, or it could be a, the via in the pad. We don't like to recommend vias in the center of the pad because that's uh, when you put down the semiconductor device, kind of, corking the bottle. And um, if the via isn't filled, then there's no way for the um, air to escape. But if you're slightly off-centered there, and you can see by swinging them, um, we create larger channels for the breakout routing. And uh, that's interesting because I'm gonna go back to eighth and ninth grade trigonometry um, to actually figure out um, what the distance and the angle should be. Uh, it depends a lot on your uh, BGA pitch, um, the SMP pad, the, the VIA land diameter pad, um, pad spacing, and uh, the VIA diameter. Um, and so 
you know, here's the chart and, you, you know, you've got to reconstruct your uh, simple uh, middle school geometry and trigonometry um, in order to decide, you know, do you want your uh, your blind vias uh, uh, centered or closer? Um, again, depending on how you're going to do your routing. Um, these are actually like uh, pictures of a 0.8 millimeter pitch BGA. Um, and you can see the swing via. Now, the point is that HDI and ultra HDI are, are techniques of miniaturization. And so if you're going to focus on using HDI, you might as well take advantage of this miniaturized. So why would you only uh, do the north, south, east, west? That's a breakout strategy if you're using mechanically drilled holes, these large things. If everything is going to be smaller, then you can take advantage of that smaller geometry um, and swing them as you've seen right here. Um, and the reason we do that is, um, you know, is the fact that with a blind via, either one layer deep or two layers deep, um, underneath these things, we then have the ability to route a lot more traces and being able to route more traces out means fewer layers and the fewer signal layers mean fewer reference layers at ground return and with that. And so that's uh, one of the, an important way to uh, allow you to control cost and material and other crosstalk techniques like that by utilizing uh, the, uh, the fact that we have these uh, very small blind vias um, as shown here. Uh, uh, and, and that then brings up the stack up. And, and one of the things to do is to stack up is the removal of decoupling capacitors um, through the use of power ground pairs. So um, here's <clears throat> IPC type one, where you have a ground flood <clears throat> um, and signal horizontal, signal vertical below that, um, or uh, uh, mechanically drilled sequential lamination for that, or or type three, where the uh, you have multiple buildups, um, but you could also be using distributed capacitance material like the 3M or the Oak Mitsui, and with your ground on the surface, the second layer would be power, and then uh, and then you start your signal. Uh, routing, either type one, type two, or type three, uh, thereby providing uh, the uh, elimination of the decoupling capacitors because you've got the distributed capacitance available. Um, and so this looks like uh, uh, techniques in one of our boards. And you can see the, the ground pins on that VGA um, with the the cross-reference like that to the flooded ground, and then the other signal pins and or power pins go down to layer two, um, or they may go down to layer three um, to a buried via to complete the, the additional route like that. And you can see these um, uh, ground stretching on the, uh, for the return path of, uh, between other ground layers farther out in the in the uh, and like I said, uh, because of this is relatively new, uh, this is a, a, a HDI training board that I use um, starting in 2016 and 2017. I was actually teaching a classes on doing this breakout technique. And we use three different uh, things, a 555 pin 0.8 millimeter BGA, a uh, 548 pin 0.65 millimeter BGA, and then a 440 pin 0.5 millimeter BGA in practicing the, uh, the breakout. And all of these could be breaking out with just four layers, uh, which made it you know, interesting. 
So you, you can kind of see the uh, the actual breakout here in a close up of this uh, 0.8 millimeter BGA um, in terms of how the uh, uh, instead of putting the via in the pad, the the via is swung to an angle off um, to drop down to the next layer. Um, the same with that 0.65, uh, the first four rows are swung and then the next three rows aren't. And even that, that 0.5 millimeter BGA, the, the, the first four, first three rows are swung and then the fourth row, because this particular IC has the opening area um, that makes it um, easier to do it. Um, alternatively, uh, this could be a, a six layer stack up um, if the 0.5 millimeter had to have six or 800 pins instead of 440. Uh, now, you know, uh, if you're not familiar with this, then the best thing to do is to go get the definitive book on this breakup and routing uh, written by my associate, Charles File, while we were at Mentor Graphics. And um, it used to be a free download from Mentor Graphics and 007, but um, things have changed and it may only be available now on Amazon, uh, but it's a very effective book to show you at different pitches and different techniques, uh, three-dimensionally, you know, how to use the swing via concept with HDI or ultra HDI. The rest of the time, I'm gonna talk about novel structures. And rather than just lines and spaces, you know, these are, are structures that specific are focused to improve high frequency performance, but also to improve um, and lower the cost by reducing the layer count on these expensive low loss materials used on the high speed ones. Um, the first one is called the Vertical Conductive Structures, VECS, <clears throat> which is a, was developed by Juan Torme of a Next Gen Technology in the Netherlands. The uh, second one, Interconnected Mesh Power System, IMPS, it was developed by University of Arkansas for uh, thin film ceramic and sputtering, uh, but now comes into the usage of ultra HDI. Um, the third one is a power mesh structure, which we developed at Hewlett Packard based on the, the IMPS structures, um, but that's ours is a four layer and IMPS is a two layer. And the last one is the channel routing, which was developed initially by Northern Nortel in Canada, um, utilizing HDI structures. So the um, all of these can utilize HDI structures, and uh, and a couple of them have now moved on to the ultra HDI kind of geometries and structures. So vertical conductive structures is a true three-dimensional uh, mechanism. In other words, um, by creating a slot in the, the BGA, uh, it's now possible to plate a very, very deep blind via, as you can see in the, the cross section, upper left-hand side. Um, you can eliminate the uh, conductive across the bottom so that each side of the hole or slot becomes a separate connection. Um, and with this, it's a, um, easier to now handle multiple power rails for FPGAs and other techniques, but also to provide the Faraday cage uh, conditions for the breakout routing. And so as an example here, an HD example where we have five laminations and five platings plus laser drilling. The VCS1 there below has only one lamination and it just has this extra mechanical drill routing step um, while you're doing the, the conventional drilling. And that's tuned into it 
um, but it can be combined with HDI shown there on the, the lower right hand side uh, when you're dealing with very, very fine pitch that doesn't provide the space for the slot on the VECS type one. But, you, you know, obviously, instead of five sequential laminations and plating and, and uh, drilling, you know, going to either one lamination or two laminations with laser drilling on top of that is a, a, a significant improvement in the vertical con connectivity, which reduces and the cost and the layer count in the materials uh, for complex BGAs. Um, the process for the VCS is relatively conventional. In other words, at the drilling time, using a special bit, you create a slot in addition to just the holes. Um, and then you go to your metallization, plate the slot, uh, you align the the BGA pin fields, um, and then you have these non-plated holes as slot separators, and then uh, the plated slot and the thing um, are aligned, um, and these then provide the connections into the the via pad stubs, uh, so that now you can uh, connect uh, things with finer ones and techniques like that shown kind of in the 3D cutout there on the lower right um, to provide uh, uh, additional routing channels and uh, power connections available that normally you would take layer after layer after layer to accomplish. So some of these VCS routing pictures um, of type one or type two, um, show the interconnections into the vertical connections. Um, and then on figure nine on the lower right um, is this completely shielded uh, interconnection. So we don't have time here to talk about VCS in detail, but there are nine publications um, listed here in the references that makes it easier for you to go back and uh, and call these up out of the magazines if you didn't see them when they were first um, published. Uh, and anyway, like I said, we've, uh, uh, we've in 007, we published nine different uh, times from uh, the, when we first introduced it in 2017, there, number two, uh, to 2021. Uh, and since then, the VCS has continued to expand um, into the ultra HDI arena uh, with even more finer pitch capabilities. So the interconnected mesh power system was developed by HIDEC at the University of Arkansas. And IMPS, IMPS, we call it, was created essentially for the multi-chip modules, the type D, the thin film ones in the late 1990s. And what multi, what they had done is instead of the conventional multi thread structure that we use now, where we have ground planes, power planes, uh, typically, you know, you know, signal X's in one direction, signal Y in another direction, and we keep stacking these layers up, uh, they are integrated together. In other words, uh, you have ground power and signals um, separating this into a coplanar structure. Um, consequently, <clears throat> uh, the ma ma majority of the area is now effectively used for routing. And typically a, a coarse grid of 75 micron um, spaces with uh, with power uh, being 150 micron or uh, a fine grid uh, where you may have uh, 20 micron traces and spaces, um, other things. And you can see that um, in the 1990s, this was 
typically only available in thin film sputtery. But today, these are the classical ultra HDI geometries. Consequently, um, the IMPS uh, technology and improvement is perfectly applicable to our use now in printed circuit boards using uh, what they had discovered 20 years ago. Um, here are some of the electrical performance of the impedance versus frequencies of, uh, of uh, the IMPS structures and, and uh, uh, with uh, no capacitors and a and you know two capacitors and things like that uh, because of the power ground distributed capacitance of the structure. Again, this is only two layers. Consequently, um, you um, you don't necessarily need decoupling capacitors um, in order to, to have noise reduction. Uh, the simple IC power mesh example, like from Synopsis, um, if you were to uh, um, query this on the internet, you would probably come up with um, a, di a diagram like this from Synopsis on IC design. And this is where uh, a lot of the electrical performance is taken from, is actually in the design of integrated circuits where they are using this integrated mesh topology. But we can take advantage of it now in, in printed circuit. And, you know, because, you know, we've got conductor routing in the X and Y with VS. Um, and then you've got intermeshed with that uh, ground and power conductors. Uh, and so when you put it all together, you end up with power conductors, ground conductors, uh, power and ground VS connecting them, and then signals also intermesh between it um, in the X and Y direction. And it's possible then to, to route um, very complex BGAs completely out in only two layers. Uh, and um, this is an actual layout, the uh, layer one signal, layer two signal, uh, layer one ground, layer one powers. Uh, and then the, the pads for the actual attachment of the chips for uh, wire bonding or, or micro BGAs. Um, this is an actual picture of an IMPS design where, um, again, everything is implemented in only two signal layers. They were talking about two signal layers because these thin film sputtered layers um, were very, very expensive. In fact, so expensive that um, the people weren't using the, the sputtering, uh, unless you could get the, the design architecture down to, to as simple as possible, which was a two layer uh, structure, which is what IMS is based on. Um, here again is a closer pitch of, of, of vias and the mixture of, of you know, two different voltage rails, as well as ground and signals um, on, on layer one. And layer two would be similar, but without the, uh, the mounting pads that you see there um, for soldering or wire bonding or flip chip. Um, again, you know, this example is one of uh, utilizing wire bonding for that. Now, power mesh, was a derivation based on the fact that um, we had implemented the IMPS in our semiconductor design and then started playing with it on our printed circuit design, but found that a, a four layer structure uh, was more suited at the time. Um, and so, you know, we have, instead of routing all of the ground, we were only routing the power and the signal and having ground plane above and below that. Uh, consequently, this gave us a lot more uh, efficiency in terms of routing, but also provided 
um, much more power ground distributed capacitance than the imps could do uh, because we had the entire the planar part of it. Um, and so um, we started designing printed circuit boards as you see here, again, using uh, this coarse grid or fine grid, um, which again is ideal for the ultra HDI. And as you can see in the picture above, uh, we used it all the way up to um, eight different voltage rails um, mixed together like this. So um, the power of this is the ability to handle um, FPGAs and complex VGAs that have multiple voltage rails where they have to be together. And if, essentially this power mesh structure is, a, um, is an offset coplanar strip line. So if you were using polar or some other uh, uh, impedance tool, um, you would pick on the offset coplanar strip line because your signal is going to have power on each side of it, and you're going to have um, ground planes above and below that. And so um, here's some classical thicknesses and uh, distances, the reference plane, um, and the trace width and the trace spacings. Um, and the impedance is possible, or differential impedance is possible, uh, depending on the mesh width. Um, so, um, and this is four half ounce copper. Uh, um, so, like I said, the most people are still working with single power planes. Some people have moved up to a split power plane, um, techniques like that. But the the mesh split planes are uh, uh, a much more advanced concept uh, where you can have many, many different voltages. Um, and, and these things are, again, tied together as a layer pair uh, because you need the orthogonal um, power mesh below that, both for signal connectivity, but also for power distribution so you don't have excessive IR drops. Um, and again, uh, in the polar, this is kind of what that looks like with the buried via in the core. Uh, successfully, we eliminated um, 14 and 16 layer boards down to four layer boards using this structure. So the cost savings, especially when we're employing very expensive low loss material, was an enormous cost savings with an improvement in high frequency performance. Because this is fundamentally an RF structure, um, very suited for extremely high speed uh, pulses, um, and yet um, at a much, much lower cost to do. Um, this is one of our first examples of eight layer to four layer utilizing uh, the, the power mesh structure. Uh, we went on to use it in a lot of different products. Um, these are just some here. Um, that one in the middle was a design that we did for Texas Instrument where they wanted to make their notebook computer thinner. So we took their um, eight layer double-sided printed circuit board and made it the entire thing a power mesh single-sided printed circuit board um, in order to, to pull the, at only four layers in order to, to allow them to make a much, much thinner notebook computer. And the unit on the right there is the first implementation of the Pentium 2, uh, utilizing the power mesh structure uh, to provide higher performance as well as um, memory. Uh, um, one of the best ones is a publication where we took um, an entire product that was a 12 layer uh, conventional multi-layer and reduced them to the four layer HDI utilizing the power mesh. Um, and you can see the flooded ground return on layers one and layers four. And these are the inner layers, which um, will look a little strange, but the, the, the design is to place the power pins on 
a grid, not the whole device, just the power pins on the grid so that you can first wire up the mesh structure for the power. And then once you've got that in, you then connect the uh, interconnections on these two layers. And once it's all connected, you go back and you expand all of the power traces to power polygons as big as possible um, based on your impedance model. So that you, you have the maximum amount of distributed capacitance between that and the, the ground plane. So you can see in the little uh, four layer HDI buildup structure there um, with your power being on layer two and, and power being on layer three, but ground being on layer one and layer four, uh, the maximum amount of the, of the power polygons provided the, the most distributed capacitance for that. Uh, now, interesting enough, um, the storage technology where this is being worked on, the 12 layers were reduced to four layers. And then um, because they had used a, 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 a back plane, middle plane, um, they couldn't reduce the size of the boards. We had reduced the layer count. But then we discovered that we could combine two of these boards into one board, re reducing a $200,000 assembly to $25,000 and eliminating, in fact, the entire back plane um, for this. And so uh, this is an interesting article to read, uh, you know, because there was... Uh, um, 16 boards in this series reduced to fundamentally four boards. And the, the four boards, like I said, in a, enormously reduced the cost of this mass storage device. The last technique um, is a thing called channel routing. First, kind of put together by Northern Telecom in Canada. And the problem if with the north, south, east, west uh, um, breakout is that, you know, like this one, a 34 by 34 BGA has 132 possible routes per layer. That is, you know, one trace between the vias, plus 20 traces in the channels um, in, in that cross. Uh, this means that eight layers would be required, uh, plus five plane layers to connect this BGA to the rest of the circuit. The through-hole vias essentially create a fence that makes it very layer intensive. Now, if we create more routing channels by allocating those breakouts to be blind vias, and they could be in this case, um, cross-shaped, then we've created new channels allowing 48 extra connections per layer. Um, so this can be reduced to two routing layers and two plane layers can, can be eliminated. And so these become blind vias to create additional channels. Well, um, by creating these channels, uh, it, uh, we now then have methods of escaping uh, the BGA limited to more than just the cross ones in the center. Um, we also have room on the backside of the through hole for parts. But depending on how the IC is laid out, you have to determine, you know, would you use cross-shaped channel? Would you use L-shaped channels? Or would diagonal channels be the best in order to uh, connect up um, where the blind vias are placed in the, the BGA breakout. Um, and like I said, on the other side of the board, um, the through holes essentially mean that your discretes on the opposite side of the BGA, you know, have room for 58 discretes connected under the BGAs because they're sharing 116 vias. But with the blind vias opening up channels, now you've got room for 183 discretes connected under the BGA sharing 366 vias compared to 116. So three times as, many, as much sharing 
and it's not possible to put your discretes within the the uh, outline of the BGA for the best electrical performance because you lowered the, the loop um, there, but you've also now provided spaces for uh, reducing the size of the board or adding more components. Um, so um, another uh, a focus on power mesh is if you have an FPGA where you can do a reassignment uh, and alignment of pins. So from an FPGA where the original chevron pattern may look like that on the left, you can reassign the pattern into the channels and then utilize the channels uh, for the blind via assignments to uh, provide additional breakout space, um, to reduce the layer count. Now, other HDI vests, advice is actually available there from Sierra. Uh, one of the things that Sierra has there is like the, the top five HDI PCB routing challenges and ways to mitigate them. Um, so, you know, it's not just uh, this lecture, but but um, Sierra has other um, advice in terms of tackling uh, using HDI routing channel, channels and things like that. You know, 10 methods to tackle signal integrity issue, eight ways to improve the thermal performance, 10 routing techniques to optimize the power distribution network, nine best routing practices to streamline HDI fabrication, 13 DRC factors to keep in mind, six things to consider when choosing an EDA tool. Um, so, um, you know, Sierra, you know, is, is providing uh, a lot of advice and tools for the designer. Uh, to learn more about each of these, uh, like I said, the swing vias are there with uh, uh, Charles Files book. The VCS has some nine magazine articles. IMPS, um, here are the four um, primary technical papers um, um, available. Now, fortunately, um, these our um, um, references are also stored in iConnect 007's technical library. Uh, and then the power mesh there, um, uh, the methods in, to analyze in a certain power mesh and design was from DesignCon, but also this month uh, uh, and there's a um, IMPS article in PCB 07, let's be out this week. And next month, there'll be a tech talk on available on PCB 07 um, in the April edition. And then uh, channel routing um, is available in the uh, um, articles from the, the board authority and other ones on the 007's technical library. Like I said, for reference reading for the future, um, some of this is covered in the HDI handbook, which you can free to download. It's also covered in the high density interconnect guide from Altium, and it's covered in Sierra Circuits high density interconnect design guide from Sierra Circuits, as well as, um, it, you know, uh, Charles Files' second book high-speed constraint values for PC layout methods um, available from Amazon or from uh, Altium and their DFM uh, design for manufacturing book available from 07 or um, DFM from Sierra Circuits, their 75 page book that's available. With that, um, we've quickly gone through a lot of this, but uh, but I thank you for your time um, and uh, open now for questions that you might have up and okay. uh, any other discussions. Great. Thank you, Happy, for talking about our blog and design guides. Uh, OK, so we have three questions in the Q&A section. And then uh, we can answer those. And after, if you have a question, you can raise your hand, and I will unmute you. OK, so Happy, do you see the questions? 
The first one is from Amba. And Amba is asking, for ground vias, we are using full contact. There is no thermal pads. Do you see any problem? I'm not sure what they mean by for ground vias. We're using full contact. There's no. Amba, can I, uh, can you unmute uh, yourself? I think that if they're talking about the, uh, um, the wagon wheel approach um, to grounding, um, there, you know, if you're just dropping a hole in the plane, um, as long as your assembly process has the ability to to provide the heat, um, you know, for that, the wagon spoke was simply um, uh, a throwback to the days where we had. Um, uh, discrete components in them, especially connectors along the edge, where uh, the uh, uh, if we didn't have the w wagon wheels, we sometimes didn't get enough heat. Um, but if if your assembly is okay with that, that shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, yeah, that is exactly what we are doing uh, for thermal yeah. wires. Uh, Second, for wires, yeah. for wires, especially since there is no uh, assembly involved there, we go for a full contact, uh, especially in high speed and RF boards, it gives a very good uh, uh, 360 degree contact in the inner layer. And uh, sometimes uh, your thermal pads or thermal uh, pads, uh, they act like a, a inductive uh, discontinuity. That's what we are doing. We do that for uh, vias as well as we do that for press fit holes, wherever there is no solder in there. But do you see any problem? Okay. Um, next question, 0.5 millimeter pitch. What vias size being used? Well, I don't remember what was on the chart, but uh, um, typically th they would be... Uh, uh, four to six mil blind laser drill blind vias, um, depending on the annular ring that uh, they're utilizing there. Unless the via is actually in the 0.5 millimeter pad, um, in, in which case, it, you know, it's typically in the three to four mil uh, diameter. What CAD tools support VCS? Um, I've seen uh, designs from Altium and I've seen designs from uh, Siemens Mentor Graphics, but I also suppose then, since those two EDA tools do it, Cadence also supports VCS, um, but I haven't used Cadence. Um, I've used mainly uh, 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 mentor and Altium tools, um, which uh, if you go back to the actual uh, references, um, uh, I think that in the article, the author talked about uh, Cadence and he talked about Altium uh, when he has some of the, in, in fact, I think they were a co-author of the paper if you look at it. So, uh, um, all of those EDA companies should be familiar uh, with it since they're, you know, been part of the publications. What do you think, when Jean here was, what do you think? And he says, well, that's, you know, you know, you know, the VCS system was invented in Europe, uh, adapted in Asia, but meets resistance in the U.S. Well, um, maybe because, uh, you know, once the big OEMs like HP and IBM and Texas Instrument no longer had their own printed circuit fabrication, um, a lot of the fabricators don't have the resources and the money 
to do um, development of relatively new systems, whereas before the the OEMs um, helped roll out new technologies. Um, and that loss of the OEMs providing that assistance um, is what the CHIPS Act now is, is hoping to replace with research and money um, to adapt new technologies, but we've got a, quite a bit of catch up to do with that. Um, there's one of them. For Ultra HDI, um, the answer is kind of for those conservative use of HDI, then the um, swing via and the HP power mesh is um, a much more kind of conventional approach to that. Those that want aggressive uh, uh, things of ultra HDI, then go for the, the, the IMPS, the IMPS, because that's the way semiconductors are designed. And that's the way in the late 1990s for thin film MCMD, we were doing it. And, and so that's much more aggressive uh, structure, but potentially a bigger payback because you have so much fewer layers. Um, if you needed more layers, I would tie these two layer structures together with the conductive paste, the transient liquid phase sintering paste. Um, you make these double-sided boards and then you, uh, you essentially uh, um, merge them together with the conductive paste and, and an adhesive layer. Um, and then you have an extremely high density structure made from um, very, very advanced double-sided. Um, and th there's no lamination at all involved. So, um, you know, th there's a, a lot of information here to mix and match and put them together to see what best serves particular cups. Says, have any of these interconnect countries been approved adopted for space applications? Um, don't know. Um, um, we never, and HP worked on, or you know, space work kind of thing. Um, I know that I was involved in some of this on the uh, uh, the uh, the moon program. Um, and so some of these have been applied to the uh, latest uh, um, moon thing, the, the HDI boards involved in that. But I don't think I've ever seen any publications on, on that. Um, is the mesh structure suitable for wide length match buses like uh, DRAM interfaces? Yeah. Well, the, the, the mess structure, um, um, I don't know how big a board we ever used the mess structure on, I don't remember, uh, but uh, uh, because it's an RF structure, um, it doesn't particularly have a, um, a, a limit there, but a, again, uh, I, I don't know uh, how big a, the match buses are likely to be kind of thing. Yeah, the Altium current documentation does not mention, um, you have to, like I said, if you look at the publication from the one uh, Torm Torme, um, you'll see that um, it uses uh, Altium. It actually says Altium on it. Um, you probably have to, you know, query the author about that. But uh, um, about in one publication, they actually use Altium EDA tool. Another publication, the co-authors were from um, 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 Cadence kind of thing. 
So um, I don't know if the VECS is in their vocabulary, but at least the, the examples utilize those tools. Now, I think the last question is for uh, Sierra Circuit. So I will ask our R&D department and I will let you know. Well, yeah, and that's also one probably for the author there on, um, because the author had promised us a uh, publication on reliability, um, but we never got one, although the author was doing reliability testing. Um, so um, I don't remember any potential cracking, but, um, but it really needs to look at um, the thermal cycling they were doing um, and things like that, which I think is available, but probably directly from the author um, at, at next gen um, and, and or uh, uh, and we'd love to publish and, and put out the reliability data if they have it available for publication. Um, also, this was investigated by HD Pug. So if you happen to be a member of HD Pug, a lot of information is uh, available through HD Pug, and um, and uh, it's up to HD Pug to um, approve that that be published to non-members of the HD Pug organization. But VECS was a project of HD Pug. Okay, thank you everyone for attending and asking questions. Thank you so much, Happy, uh, and we will see you next time on May 15th. Yeah, and I'll be at Apex uh, the whole week in case any of you happen to be going at Apex. Um, so um, yeah, you can you can find me at the iConnect 07 booth on the floor there, uh, but I'll be mainly in technical sessions or committee meeting, but uh, you can leave a note for me um, if you are being at Apex. And uh, hope to see you all next time in May for our, our next uh, presentation on HDI design. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you, happy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.